I was in Vero for three weeks, and that was long enough. Um, and then, uh, then uh, after working in Vero, that, and actually his first experience with marine mammals was at that point. Um, he was doing a lot of stuff with the Native American uh, natives that lived there, a lot of the Eskimos, and, and their um, interaction with marine mammal um, populations. So his first experience with marine mammals started with Vero, um, and he moved to New York Alaska, Fairbanks, um, where he's um, been for a long time and has done a lot of work with toxicology, green animals, and how they interact with um, humans because humans are often also in Alaska consuming um, green animals. So you've got to have a connection between the green animals itself, the environment, and um, the human population. And that's, that's part of what he's been talking about. So I'm happy to have um, Todd here for, for a, a seminar to hear that. He's got some, obviously, some interaction.
for people for various wildlife. And just want to point out that she goes out and breaks little errors and, and uh, provides seals for her young. And uh, just it's graphic for a reason, just to show you that they are incredible hunters. Uh, you can put more footage and, and someone up here how they hunt walrus, how they hunt the little whales. These animals, these polar bears, can kill very large organisms. Watching them kill and pull blue whale out of a hole is awe-inspiring. They are amazing predators. And if you don't know, they're very closely related to the grizzly bear, the brown bear. They can actually breed and produce grizzlies. Yeah. But this is what Coca-Cola wants you to see. Right? And this is maybe what you would want to see. But, um, they are beautiful animals, they're very charismatic, they're very interesting, but they are uh, predators. And uh, they enjoy a uh, marine mammal diet. So what I'd like to do is talk to you a little bit about these paradigms that we think in. I'd like to review a little bit of the history I've had up there because I really want to give uh, credit to the people who uh, have helped. And it's really, it's a privilege. Being in this profession is a privilege. And uh, I, thank my, I thank, I'm thankful all the time, and my wife is too. We get to raise our kids in this environment. It's, it's really a great privilege. I'd like to talk to you about some of the tools we're developing for our research that have impacted students from Lost Landing. And then a little bit about sentinel species, because I, I can't escape without knowing that. So when we talk about the environment, disease agent and the host, we need to talk about the epidemiologic triad. That's the way we want people to think. You've probably seen this before. But John Harley, if you know him, uh, he was in Santa Cruz, worked in the Costa lab for a while as an undergrad. He helped me put this together along with Carson Hooker. We kind of put a marine spin on this where the ocean, microorganisms, the disease agents, and hosts such as uh, spill oil, we want to better appreciate this interaction. We want Think about the interaction of living and non-living components. And we're trying to develop this better in our work. And again, I point out that here's something else that enjoys the occasional thing. But I'm going to keep emphasizing that because we see seals, walrus, sea lions as the middle of the food web. Often I hear people down here talk about them at the top of the food web. That may be true here. Unless you're a great white shark, a kill whale. But um, seals are really important. They're kind of like a big fish. Um, <laughs> um, so you got to think about that. Uh, but then there's a food item in the last. So how we tie this to the, uh, the One Health concept is the, actually it's the American Veterinary Medical Association that said we're going to have an integrated national strategy to better train veterinarians and to get more involved with public health through this paradigm. That is, we're going to recognize ecosystem health, human health, and animal health overlap. The vet schools were criticized by the National Academy of Science for training too many small animal clinicians and not enough big thinkers. And we're going to follow their advice, and we're going to produce Alaskan residents who have this perspective. Now, they can go into small practice, but they're going to be the eyes and ears of surveillance when there's disease issues that need to be addressed. I could give examples where large animal veterinarians and other veterinarians have been the first one to observe a foreign animal disease or a disease of concern. And we need to have a better public health response in that respect. The Department of Defense, Homeland Security, all very concerned about the lag phase from the point of detection until we actually do something. So think about West Nile virus, influenza, monkey pox, all these things you probably heard about in the press. So it's actually, it's one health, it's not just a feel good, oh, how can we all buy out together, right? It, they actually think it's a way of improving public health and uh, being more responsive. So I come back to our Chupik artist, and I want you to recognize the smiling Chupik Eskimo, surrounded by terrestrial and marine wildlife, all I did was gave them our proposal, which was we're going to study nutrients and contaminants in your foods and how food processing alters them and what it means to your health. That's all we gave him. He came up with this. And I thought it was interesting that he took a Venn diagram approach too, how things overlap and interact. And he put the chew big at the center. And 
I thought that was really interesting. And so in discussions with him, he goes, oh, I forgot the plants. And I said, that's okay. They're, they take care of the plants. See? So uh, I thought it was very interesting, and I, I'm really proud of this uh, artwork. It became an icon of our research. We wanted something that people could identify with other than classic scientific ways of representing what we were studying. And this was very popular in the community. So then here's our way of looking at it. So when talking about One Health context in Alaska, it's real important to recognize we link wildlife and human health in three major ways. One is we discuss the subsistence diet. That's in and out. That's pretty obvious. Here is a bullhead whale that's been harvested that's going to be uh, cut up for food, and there's Price Brower, uh, one of our colleagues in Vero, and that's my wife, Carla. So this will get processed for food. And then here's, uh, obviously, salmon. And then over here is probably uh, bearded seal that's drying. So subsistence diets are obvious. Wildlife as a model for humans may not be as obvious, but at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, we're rather famous with NSF and NIH for hibernation models, and, and sorry, and DOD, Department of Defense. And the reason that is occurring is because we have animal models that hibernate at minus two Celsius. Brown squirrels freeze. They go to minus two Celsius when they're hibernating. This absolutely fascinates health professionals and people in defense because obviously it helps in dealing with trauma, organ transplants, heart attack, and stroke. How do these tissues have the resilience to deal with going minus two Celsius in a mammal? And every 30 days they warm up when they're hibernating. And one theory is they warm up to dream. In other words, the brain has to say, oh yeah, I'm still alive. It's, it's fascinating. And so these animal models are uh, very important in uh, physiology research and potential uh, biomedical uh, processes for improving human health. Wildlife is an indicator of human risk. I'll talk about that when I present the sentinel species idea to you. So think of how wildlife can tell us what's going on out there in the ecosystem that might be advantageous. So this is how we see the world uh, in our lab at the University of Alaska. What's important to recognize is this is also important in outreach, education, and community involvement. And so here I am in Sitka, Alaska at Mount Edgecombe High School, which has Alaskan natives from all over the state attending this high school. And here we're using stranded cetacean as a teaching opportunity where we talk about ocean and human health, the marine ecosystem, and then anatomy and physiology as the animal. This has become really popular. This is called necropsy demonstrations. But what we do is we go into the mission to really talk about the marine environment and how important it is to humans and teach them about the adaptations these organisms are undergone to uh, be effective in the marine environment. And over here is a harbor seal. And in this case, this was high school students. In this case, this principal canceled all classes, kindergarten to 12th grade. The whole student body came out on the basketball court. And the uh, hunters and I, butcher these animals and necropsy these animals at the same time. I call it a nursery. <laughs> that he's taking food and telling them about how they harvest the animal and what they take for food. At the same time, I was talking about scientific sampling and how we do health assessments. It was very powerful. It, it really meant a lot for the community. And so we're asked to do this more. And up here is one of my favorite images. This is a couple miles offshore. Jim may recognize him. Uh, but there's whales out here, and this is called a gumiak. It's a bearded seal skin uh, boat. This is what they hunt 50 ton whales out of. And uh, they paddle out, and it's a hand thrown harpoon. This is their bowhead line. They'll be behind this as the bowhead surface. It's a, it's a stealth hunt in this case. So I wanted to just point out how we uh, interact with these communities. It's all about fish in our state. Um, Pathways, nutrients, and contaminants, commercial, subsistence, recreation. Fish are really important to us in Alaska, so I just want to emphasize that. So we do our research, we do our outreach, we do our education, we do our community involvement all at the same time, and uh, we're really proud of that. So this is a, what you Jim say, in the world? It's, my boss used to say, no, no, Barrow's not the end of the world, because you can see it from there. <laughs> uh, Barrow is the highest point in the United States as far as north, and uh, it's right at the Chuck 
touching both the sea, it's a remarkable place, it's an area that is highly productive, the Inupiaq are there for a reason, because incredible amount of resources are there. So this is just the upper half of, upper quarter of Alaska. This is a county known as the Norsco Borough. I'd like to point out it's the size of Minnesota. Okay, so, uh, and it had, when I was there, it had about 8,000 people total. So we were, we were the species that was probably at the lowest population. There was half a million caribou in there. So it's a remarkable place. So I was a research biologist there, but they wanted a DPM PhD, and as I walked through this, I think you'll see why. So they said, we need someone who will study more than well health assessments. That's still going on today, they still do that, and they still hire veterinarians to work with biologists to do that. And that was important for the International Land Commission. They also decided they need a veterinarian to address environmental contaminants. Immediately in 1995, I was going on health. I didn't know that's what it was called. But they wanted to address animal health and human food security at the same time. So I was responsible for determining these environmental contaminants having adverse effects on the animals, but at the same time, I had to discuss how they were as food items for people. Uh, it was fascinating, and uh, we've never changed that perspective. We also had to deal with food security and safety in response to mortality events. Caribou, moose, seals, something that would be 100, 1,000, thousands of dead animals, and we would have to respond to figure out what caused the mortality event, but we also had to determine whether it was a food safety issue. And uh, we ran into things like brucella. I'm sure people know about that here, but that's a zoonotic agent that's not fun to get. And then radioisotopes. People are always re releasing radio nuclides, so as a toxicologist, I'm always in business because there's always a radioactive accident somewhere. And regardless of how far away it is, it gets people excited in the wrong way. And uh, so always dealing with radio nuclides. Uh, it obviously involved remote, high north communities. Had to learn how to work with communities of 100 or 200 people, who may be 90% reliant on local foods. That's that's a very different way of looking at how people eat than we may get out here. The other part of the job was humaneness and efficiency of hunting. They wanted to improve their hunting uh, time to death. They wanted to reduce, and they wanted the number of injuries that didn't result in mortality reduced. So we worked really hard with them to improve hunting methods. And a veterinarian is usually someone who's responsible for appropriate um, <coughs> handling of animals, including how they're euthanized or killed. And so this was a big part of my job, and it's still a big part of the job up there. The basic biology, this was absolutely critical. And I think this is where people here who are being trained in biology should recognize this, is that my training, as Jim said, I didn't know anything about marine animals when I went up there. But fortunately, they had three people there who were well-trained in marine biology or wildlife biology. Without that, I would have been lost. And so I want to point that out. But that was critical for the veterinarian being there. What was important was I could interpret all of what that <coughs> had in the proper context. If we knew about the population status and trends, if you really think about it, how often do you have that advantage? Often we're working in mysterious situations where we really don't know the status of the population or the stock or the species. Because we had such an intensive bullhead whale program related to their growth and their population status, I, I was able to do much better research because of what the biologists were doing. Well, I quickly learned hunters, biologists, physiologists, ecologists, etc., were very important in research and teaching. And so we never left that. So for 20 years, we've, we've been doing that. It's been very helpful. So why did we go to the University of Alaska Fairbanks? The National Institutes of Health decided they wanted to fund uh, an infrastructure grant at uh, UAF. So this is how we ended up there, environmental agents of disease. And so then we took these concepts and we've been applying them to our program since. Ecosystem health, ocean and human health, NOAA and NSF, and One Health. So get to the people in our group. We have a postdoc, we have a research professional. Some of you may know the Castellinis. Uh, they worked in Pinnipets for 30 years, 40 years. Uh, incredibly valuable person out in the lab. She has much more experience than I do, so it, it, it's great. And then here's some examples of uh, the students. And I'll highlight these guys at the end because they come from down here. And just want to know there's a California. 
are funding some of our work. So obviously it involves a lot of teamwork, and uh, I always joke, I don't know if I'm there or there. Um, I think I switch back and forth, but the idea is we have to fight the current uh, as a team. Some of you may have romantic ideas of Alaska, and that's great. Um, we, our tourism folks love that. Uh, but we were no longer uh, dealing with such logistic issues that we have them much everywhere. This isn't our field station. We can do a little better than that. And uh, as much as I'd like to be romanticized as the rugged individualist wildlife veterinarian out there tackling moose, not using any chemical mobilizing agents or anything, <laughs> but, but that's sort of not true either. Uh, this is actually the group that uh, first climbed uh, Denali. And Diana Campbell's related to them, and she provided them to me. So I'd like to talk about some of the tools we're developing and uh, how uh, some of the groups down here have helped us. It's this blood-soaked filter paper technique that I think is something that's really kind of revolutionized field work for a lot of us. What uh, EPA and the Department of the Interior with a human health group said, can you help us develop rural monitoring programs for disease agents? Can we find a simplified, simplified and robust technique? And what it's called is the Rural Alaska Monitoring Program. And so I'm going to introduce you to a technique that uh, you might want to adopt or you might want to help us uh, Validated. This is Pat Curry from uh, University of Calgary, and these are the filter papers we'll be talking about, these filter paper strips. Here's an example of a hunter killed animal and how you can collect the blood by uh, slicing the jugular vein and applying these filter papers to that free flowing blood. You can also do it live capture where you pull it out in a syringe and you can soak the filter paper. So, this is a technique that uh, has been used in. I don't know if you can know that, like an infant's a block of blood. But here we can get a little, oops, sorry. Here we can get a little more volume. So the idea is you cut it here after it's been blood soaked. And this strip will absorb about 100 microliters of blood. It's fairly standardized. And so this is really important uh, in the standardization of the sampling technique. But what we do with that is we can air dry it. And then you can stick it in an envelope, and it's preserved. So in the field, you don't have to worry about carrying around whole blood. You have to keep it frozen. And that's why it's so valuable, because we can archive it that way, we can transport it that way. And um, that's why those agencies wanted us to help develop this technique. So we know Francis is going. So we validated this with harbor seals from the Marine Mammal Center, as well as uh, uh, bottom of the vault in Sarasota Bay. So this is coming out this month, or is out now, maybe, in the Journal of Wildlife Diseases, where we were able to validate this from mercury. Now, working with Colorado State University, we're going to see if we can do additional chemical surveillance using this technique. So you may have a use for this, if you think about some of your field operations or how you want to archive blood. Um, it, it very much limits the uh, the logistical challenges and the cost of, of sampling blood. It also allows biologists and hunters to do it in a more convenient manner. So we were able to use something called the direct mercury analyzer for this. No processing was required. The funding agency said yes, we want to move forward with this. It's this simple, it really is. So here's that filter paper. We cut the strip of blood off. This actually fits perfectly in the direct mercury analyzer, and you analyze the whole thing. It, boom. So everyone's very pleased with, with how this has worked out. And here's the data for it. This is the whole blood, so we had matched whole blood as part of the validation study. And then down here is the filter paper with the whole blood on it. And as you can see, we've got a very nice relationship uh, between the two. The dark are the dolphins and the clear are the harvest fields. So we've been asked to move along on this and develop it for other species from mercury, but also include other analytes. So this unbiased chemical surveillance is what we're going to try next. And what we're going to do is use a, a mass spec technique that uh, Dr. Bouley at Colorado State is developing. And what we'll do is have various extraction methods that based on differences in solubility. We'll go from water-soluble to lipid-soluble extractions, and we'll put it on the uh, liquid chromatography 
barbecue aspect that he has two of these down there. And we're going to start off with Northern Fur Seals. We got funding uh, to do this in Northern Fur Seals, but then we're going to expand into other species. It's not just about environmental contaminants. We're also seeing it work for us with serology and PCR. Our colleagues in the same issue of neurologic diseases have published this. We're looking at various infectious agents, uh, serology of the infectious agents, that is looking for antibodies to those agents. We're actually, we're now looking at, looking for DNA of the pathogens in the blood. So you can see how this is going to become a valuable sampling technique. The key is, blood soap filter paper is allowing for multiple uses, and this is going to be real important. So again, serologic and PCR based. John Harley, we'll get to later, he's going to try and do this with messenger RNA. I think he's dreaming, but I think we're at the floor, right? Take on the challenges, don't, don't feel limited. Uh, so we're going to see how far we can go with our PCR based uh, methods. So again, one sampling event. We can look at multiple environmental agents from one sampling event. This is being funded by the department here at EPA because they're really concerned about climate change and they want a one health perspective on this. So we'll be analyzing some of the strips in real time and some of the other strips are going to go into an archive. So that's what they would like to develop. If you've ever had to store blood over many, many years, frozen, it's a real difficult thing because of the cost and also because when major failures occur, we were shocked. Uh, we got contacted by some Scandinavians and said, can we please use this technique on humans? And that's where we slammed all the braces and said, wait a minute, because obviously uh, handling human blood is very different um, because of safety issues. But also because we weren't sure if we should be interpreting data from humans yet. But they want us to develop before that. So where we're going with this is we're going to develop these techniques for how we can um, improve our antibody detection, the PCR-based molecular diagnostics. Again, the DNA gave you work great for mercury. But what surprised us was they immediately asked us to do additional elements, essential elements and other non-essential elements like cadmium, and uh, other toxicants. The LUA concentrating methods are important because some assays you can't have the root plasma. I'll show you what I mean here in a minute. So the elevate might be too dilute. Well, we found a centrifugal concentrating method that seems to work, at least for uh, macromolecules. So this is how it'll work. This is the filter paper. Remember, with the DNA 80, we just put that directly on. So if you want to look for antibodies or anything like that, you cut it up and then you put it in this uh, possibly buffered saline. And then you can use the centrifugal concentration to get down to maybe the original concentration in the plasma. And uh, we did some preliminary data on bottom-nose dolphin blood for toxoplasma gondii. And here is the serum titer. So this is serum that we got directly from the animal. And then we did that procedure I just showed you where we concentrated the LUA. So we had 13 negative animals, of which 12 remained negative. So that was a very important finding. And here I've highlighted where, in red, where between the serum and the elevate technique, we were within a two-fold dilution. You know anything about titers that are two-fold? So 2048, the next one is 4096, because you're having the sample. Uh, that's how the titer works. So this actually worked pretty well based on the antibodies of toxoplasma. I assume everybody here knows about toxoplasmosis here for the yeah. otters. Well, this is a serious disease uh, up in the Arctic as well. Um, it's actually passed on through the food web. It's not cat litter and cats. It's, it's actually a food web based. We also decided to do preliminary work on organochlorines. A uh, vet student from CSU got a, an award come up and work with us in the summer, Lily. And she did this in Tercyops, again, in bottom of the dolphins. And her preliminary data was encouraging that we can use the filter paper technique for organochlorines. However, 
we need to find lower detection levels. And now we're working with a group in Environment Canada, Gary Demir, who's a very famous environmental chemist, at least in the Arctic. He's going to help us see if we can uh, improve this with lower detection levels. But the data was promising for things like PCBs. So we've been asked to go on into essential elements and other non-essential elements. Uh, these are not as direct as doing the total mercury, but we'll see. And so it looks like my sabbatical will be to do an unbiased surveillance of these organic chemicals at Colorado. I think this is encouraging for field work and, and hope people can see how archiving these and using these can be beneficial. So enough marketing of cellulose paper. Uh, we're pretty excited about it because human health people and wildlife management folks and environmental management agencies are saying they all want this. So it's an example of one health. And even though it's a simplified technique, I hope you appreciated that it's a sophisticated techniques to analyze the filter paper. Does that make sense? So don't focus on, the filter paper, it's so easy. No, it's the technology that we can apply to the filter paper that's exciting. And you can see I'm kind of animated about it because I am sort of super geek. Um, when it comes to this kind of work in the lab, and our lab people are just thrilled with this because they know what it's like to have blood and have the blood tubes be, be frozen. If this will work, it will really help a lot of field work. So when it comes to several species, some of you may have already heard this stellar sea lion story, but I really would like to emphasize it because it's one of the major issues we're facing. When it comes to one health or ecosystem health, several species are really an important part of that. Uh, this is now combined with the filter paper approach. Uh, NOAA has decided that we're going to try the filter paper approach on sterile sea lines. If you want to talk about remote sampling, I'll show you here in a minute where they have to go. It's important to recognize sentinels are usually recognized as something that integrates the system. And for the sterile sea line, it's, it's fish consumption for us. It's the pathways of contaminants. So they represent an integration of, of fish, you might say in that area, but it also applies to commercial and subsistence fish. So there's, again, a human health connection. Several sea lions are a management concern. They're also very cute. Those are the two pictures. Mm -hmm. they're, they're cute, they're too common. Not a lot of Not sure what she's mad about, but I think probably the photography has to close. Mm -hmm. uh, but where it is, the lead on this, along with our colleagues here from uh, NOAA and Fish and Game and, and, at the university, we're focusing on the females and looking at how female mercury concentrations are uh, distributed over the uh, Aleutian Islands. Mercury is important because of in utero exposure. So here's the Aleutian Islands, and well, they, they change the designation all the time, Jim. Now they're called a distinct population segment. We used to call them stocks, that was wrong. Uh, but they get called all kinds of things. Now they're called DPS. But there's a magic line here. And it's the Eastern DPS and the Western. So you can see this group's doing well. And this group's not doing so well. Indicated by a population status. Yeah. So I want to remind you, Kenneth, I'll remind you, um, mercury biocumulus <laughs> and That's why he's in front row. It's neurotoxic in humans and other fishing animals, and it crosses the sun. And we also found out it's really high in fog. <laughs> so again, congratulations on your NSO board. That's great. Uh, well, it's not great that Mercury's high in fog, but getting in the board is great. Um, there's a lot to be learned about Mercury. It's, you think it's, it's all studied, but we really don't understand it very well. So this Western group, through these publications, has consistently had high levels. And it didn't really spark interest until the Castellini paper came out. And again, remember, it's the same population segment. And so Dr. Ria and I and some others decided we needed to look at these guys. Now, we don't sample them as they're coming out, so I don't mean to show you this image. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is they are whiskered, they are covered in hair. So that means this was developed in utero. I think that's pretty good evidence. <laughs> and so this means this was what they we can look at the mercury exposure in these guys when they were during gestation, right? When they were in Europe. 
very important because that's when most of the adverse effects might take place. Luckily, they hold on to this for two, three months. And so Noah and others go out and they can sample these animals. These young fellow sea lions. So we can get at their lanugo and uh, determine what their new exposure was. I don't know how many of you have ever had the opportunity to work on a set of sea lions, but a sea lion pup is so much easier to handle than a male set of sea lions. <laughs> but we can appreciate that. And, and so we were able to crank up our sample size tremendously as well. So we got the cohort of concern, and we can increase our, increase our sample number at the same time. And so that was really important. So the Cassidy L paper covered mercury in this area. And then Larry Bia um, expanded the research into the more uh, concerning areas where fellow sea lions are not recovering. And so she uh, did this paper in 2013. And this got the attention of, of NIMS. And we're getting more support to follow up on this. So here's the reason why we keep adding data to this figure. As you go from east to west, you can see that mercury concentrations climb. And then in this Agatha region, they jump up. And this was a bit concerning, and then they come back down again. So now we have Russian colleagues providing samples, and uh, we'll see if we can work out what's happening. Well, so what? They're bigger. They're, the concentrations are greater. Well, actually, comparing blood and hair showed that hair is a very good matrix for assessing what might be going on in the circulation. So they, they correlate nicely. But also, we can use hair or blood to determine what the risk might be, or put this in some kind of risk context. And so here are guidelines for um, benchmarks for hair and blood that clearly show that there could be a, a neurological effect to these uh, concentrations. Some are based on wildlife and some are based on human. But the idea is to put it in the context to say these are relevant concentrations. They're not just higher, but they are moving into the relevant range. And, uh, a bit of concern. So the problem coming through the diet, uh, a lot of people want to talk about volcanoes, and a lot of people talk about Asia. We don't know. We don't know where the mercury is coming from. We just know the pathway is going to be in the diet. So now the commercial fishing industry and the Department of Environmental Conservation in Alaska are working with us. The commercial fishing industry is providing us fish for free. That's a big deal. And from that region, that Western Aleutian. And so now we're looking at what might be going on with the fish. So that's why they're important to sentinels, uh, because of management concerns, good health, understanding what's going on in Western Aleutians. I assume John Harley and Stephanie Hughes are known to this audience. Okay. John Harley? No. Oh, of course, John. <laughs> Sharp. 
parts. They're eating other hydrophobic fish, old fish. And so we've been working with our Mexican colleagues on this, and uh, he's going to take a closer look at what might be driving that mercury accumulation. And uh, that's a good step for now. These two, no problem. This one, it's one of those risky ones, so he'll fall back on feeding ecology if we can't do the genetic work. But the, the colleagues in Mexico would like this stuff. Stephanie, who seemed like that more of a, an applause for her. <laughs> She's going to be mostly doing genealogy work. And so haptoglobin is an inflammatory uh, indicator. And she's going to be, she's doing this right now, where she's looking at haplogloves in uh, cell sea lions and looking at what might drive variation in haplogloves levels. She's also going to establish baseline immune parameters in free ranging cell sea lions to determine that will be used for determining factors that lead to immunomodulation. So what she's doing, like we all have to do in wildlife work, she's establishing the normals before she looks at adverse effects. And so she's got to say, well, what, what's normal? And I got to consider the biology of the animals. So she's got to look at sex, age, reproductive status, and how that might affect the metrics she wants to use. So great physiology, biology work. But then we'll be coming to here and looking at response to uh, contaminants. This is her rat title, because we're still trying to get her to sort this out a little bit. But then she's going to look at how contaminants might be involved modulating uh, the immune system cell of sea lions. So you can see between Seth's work and John's work, we're trying to get more into adverse effects. We're also doing this with the Marine Animal Center where we're trying to look at neurodevelopment and harbor seal puffs related to their mercury concentrations. So the lab is trying to move with Moss Landing's help, Marine Animal Center's help, and what we're doing here, we have to try and figure out what's going on with mercury in these pinnipeds. I still don't know what she means by this. You're welcome to read it. <laughs> Maybe Jim can translate. Is that Stephanie or what? It's, it's Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> Decoding cumulative effects of nutrition status and infectious disease contaminant burden that threaten the health status of marine mammals using an in vivo immune function model. And F, this one killed me. I don't know what epigenetics were. Awesome. That's because she shares an office with John Harley. <laughs> so I, I think having those two cook up these ideas is great. And uh, they're both Californians. Thank you very much. Uh, we really appreciate it. Got to acknowledge uh, the permits and the boats and the vessels and all the money that all puts into this. It's a lot of investment to do the sea lion work. So in conclusion, One Health in Alaska, we have a natural laboratory that this intrigues you. One Health can advance through simplification of some methods, but must be validated through modern techniques. Alaska and California. I think there's synergism there. You might agree. And then the whole sentinel species concept, it, it's, it's true here in San Francisco Bay as, as well as in Alaska. I think the uh, marine mammal that are in the San Francisco Bay region are important sentinels for a mercury contaminated environment. I've been making that speech for about four days straight now. I'm getting too tired of hearing it. <laughs> but I really, I, I'm going to push hard on this because of the concentrations we've seen in, in the harbor seals and the potential issues that might be popping up at the Marine Animal Center. Uh, I'm, I'm inspired to become more aggressive, but I need help from Moss Landing and the Marine Animal Center to make sure I'm not going off and being rogue. Uh, but I think it's time to see where we can go with that. So thank you very much for your attention.
potentially result in human conflict. And so we had to haze them back. And we were trying to teach them to line the sand, sort of actually the gravel line, line the gravel. Uh, so that was a part of the interactions. Also, people weren't believing us. <laughs> they bears don't do that. I'm standing right here. And so we also do a lot of documentation. That's why we went up in the helicopter, because uh, we thought there were a lot of bears in the area, but it's like Count Fushin Aquarium, you know, just drive around. And we had to go up in the helicopter and survey it real quick. And that's when we counted like 60 bears. Unbelievable. Suddenly, Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS was up on the next plane. They saw a, a looming problem. Because as soon as there's an unfortunate human incident, that's, it's usually is bad for the predator, right? So uh, they wanted to get up there and do this quickly. So they came up with a three strikes in your policy. And that was the bear returned to the community three times, and then the third time. Uh, we had to euthanize it. In other words, it was a problem there. It, it meant for it made for a very stressful mm -hmm. moment. Yeah. Tom, you're you work in an environment where mercury is accumulating from all over the planet. That's right. And um, through distillation processes. And and uh, you say, you know, it's easy to blame the Asians or right. the different People from, have you had any luck with mercury isotopes and trying to define where the source is actually coming from this? Or? Yeah. Um, that, we've been working on it for 18 months. And we're, we're trying to write a proposal that would look at mercury isotopes, but the caveats are too numerous, as you know, for how isotopes fractionate with mercury. And, and so, between the sunlight and the feeding ecology and trophic levels, we, we can't use, we don't think we can use our fish and marine mammals to do that source determination. We think we've got to go back to the abiotic matrices to do that. Um, nobody's sampling in that area for that. So it's a real challenge. Uh, okay, what we're talking about is there's many micro mercury isotopes, and in some ways you can kind of fingerprint the source. However, once sunlight and biological processes have acted on the mercury, that alters the isotopes in a way that really lose the fingerprint from the source. And so we've been trying to figure out how we could use the samples from the stellars and from their prey. But every time we sit down and work it out, we can't make a strong enough proposal because we end up spending half the proposal outlining the caveats. It doesn't make for a strong argument, right? So if you have any great insight, we'd appreciate it, because I've worked with Canadians, I've worked with Bloom, and we can't find a way to, to do it in that level of biota. We have to go back to the primary producers or actual abiotic. Right, it's like snow or glacial deposits. Yeah, or sediments. Or, and as you know, we have a big problem in the oceans because so much volcanic activity. And so could we actually pick up an Asian mercury signature in that background. Yeah, so it's a very good question, and we are trying to figure out a way to do it. Um, I noticed on your graph that the mercury levels in the blood were really quite high. I've been looking into the mercury in sharks, especially in muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. How does the mercury concentration in, say, the blood or the muscle tissue compare? Is it still quite that high? Are you about the cellars? Yeah, or I guess in marine mammals in general. Um, we just put out a paper, and I didn't get it in the presentation, where we actually did, well, we bragging about this president, right? it's not my job. <laughs> Tiffany Perkins did a body burn study where she took harvest seals apart and essentially put them back together from a mercury perspective and developed a model of how mercury distributed in, in uh, harvest seal cups. We went and did the same thing in cell sea lions, and the majority of the mercury was in muscle and the pelt, just like what Tiffany found in harvest seals. And what we do with body burdens and so on, there you're calculating the concentration in the tissue, but you're also determining the amount of mercury in the tissue, in other words, the actual mass, not the concentration. 
That's the value of doing those kind of studies. We only did it on six of those sea lions, but it got published because they're very hard to get. And when she looked at the hair of those animals, the hair correlated very nicely with the other tissues. So as hair concentration murky went up, there was a parallel increase in all the other tissues. She looked at muscle, and muscle was a good indicator of mercury concentrations in the other tissues as well. And what Tiffany's paper was really important is we were trying to emphasize that actually liver, kidney, and other tissues are actually very poor at showing the status of mercury because it, it accumulates in it over their age. So Tiffany showed that muscle is actually a very good way of looking at the overall uh, contamination of that animal. And we repeated it in the cell sea lines and we got the same thing. So does that answer your question? So most of it's in the muscle and the pelt. And the hair and the muscle are probably really good tissues to get an idea of the status of that animal if we can't afford to do the whole 13 or 14 compartments for each animal. So the, the blood seems like it would be a very convenient way to, yes. to do that. Do those reflect the same levels in the human tissue? We're cautious about blood. Um, only because a recent meal high in mercury could cause blood concentrations to shoot up and misrepresent what's in the body. That's the only caveat I put there. Yeah, it's more of a transient medium. Uh, but if, if they're really on their diet that they typically are exposed to, then it is useful. And that's what we showed with the uh, stellar sea lions around Agatude was that the hair did parallel what was in the blood in that case. Blood is a bit transient, but does it work most of the time? Yes. And whole blood are working. Mm -hmm. And we're also getting into studies where we're looking at how selenium and mercury compartmentalize in the blood. That's also becoming interesting because mercury and selenium compartmentalize differently. And if selenium is helping protect from mercury toxicosis, they kind of have to be in the same <laughs> location. And, and so we're, we're doing, uh, we, did, we did dogs fed fish, we did the bottom of dolphins, and, and now we're going to do the stealth sea lions because we want to see how taxonomically these animals compare as to how they distribute mercury and selenium. And uh, the physiologists are really excited about this. So that's another aspect of your question is that even within the blood, we may have compartmentalization. The pack cells, the serum plasma, things like that. All right. Send more students. <laughs> <laughs>